both with the shooting in its aftermath, but also with the professional sports leagues? Well, so far, the White House, as you, you noted, David, uh, the president sent tweets out earlier saying that he was sending federal uh, troops or law enforcement to Kenosha, Wisconsin, to assist. He also used that opportunity to uh, repeat a, an attack that he's lobbed against other Democrat leaders, where he says that they all they have to do is ask him for help and that he'll come in vis-a-vis uh, -vis Minneapolis earlier this summer. Do we expect uh, uh, the vice president to address this issue tonight? Yes, we do, actually. We just uh, got word that the vice president will at least reference uh, the unrest that's going on in Kenosha. I mean, it's hard to miss, and it's hard for the White House to ignore it, uh, given uh, the national attention on this issue, but also the attention that it's been given during the convention in terms of law and order and safety. Yeah. I, I would just interrupt Eugenie. I'm sorry. We just have a headline out now on the Bloomberg. President Trump is arriving at Fort McHenry for an appearance. So we know Vice President Pence will be speaking from there. Now President Trump will be there with him. Oh, interesting. So it's his appearance for the day, I guess, or for the I, night, I guess, for the convention. <laughs> now, Mario, I wanted to ask you, you know, does President Trump run into any difficulty here? I understand your, what you're saying in terms of how they want to use this to their advantage, but he also is president. He is the incumbent president. What happens in Kenosha, Wisconsin, that is a state in the United States that he is governing. How does he indeed explain what he has done over the last three and a half years to address the problems with policing that these protests are talking about. Well, Jeannie, it's actually, quite frankly, one of his, uh, the, the soft spots uh, in, in his presidency right now that they've been trying to shore up and, uh, in terms of the speakers that we've seen come out of the convention that talked about some of his, um, his issues on race and trying to shore those, uh, those weaknesses up in the minds of voters. But also, I mean, this is something that's kind of dogged the president uh, this summer. He, it's a twin crisis that he's dealt with that's really ravaged him in the polls. That's been the coronavirus pandemic, and then that's been a racial unrest. So, no, this is, a, this is definitely something and this is tricky territory for the president right now. Yeah, Mario, this is Rick. I think he's making a concerted gamble where he's choosing to be the law and order guy, hoping that the suburban voters that he desperately needs are afraid of the uh, unrest spilling out of the cities and into the suburbs. Yet at the same time, the Biden campaign is trying to find a different way to talk about it, where they create engagement and unity, thus giving comfort to the suburbs that there's a solution to it that doesn't include troops. So, I mean, this is really a fault line in this campaign. I don't anticipate the Trump people taking any change of that position, but it's a real gamble for them to, to think that the law and order message is going to appeal to those suburban voters. Yeah, yeah, well, he's really dug in on that message for the better part of the summer. And that's, again, uh, the, the polls, at least, the voters, don't seem to be too comfortable with that approach. But I would note that coming out of the convention last week, polls have shown that Biden hasn't gotten a bump that he expected to get out of the convention or that one would normally get out of the convention. And there was also a little bit of narrowing the gap in the suburbs. So the president may or may not, his, his bet may or may not be panning out. Okay, thank you so much to Bloomberg White House reporter Mario Parker, who's been with us throughout these conventions. And it's not just Kenosha, Wisconsin, of course, uh, that are, is really news tonight. It's also what's going on down on the Gulf Coast. Hurricane Laura is barreling toward the Gulf Coast with winds of 150 miles an hour. That makes it a Category 4 storm, but it is just below the threshold for a Category 5. And experts say it just could end up being the most powerful storm ever to hit Louisiana. I welcome now Craig Fugate. He is former FEMA administrator under President Obama and current chief emergency management officer at One Concern. So welcome, Craig. Really good to have you with us. Give us a sense of just how bad this hurricane looks right now. About as bad as it gets. Uh, a storm surge in a very vulnerable area along the Texas and Louisiana coast. Uh, high winds. Uh, already seeing tornadoes coming on shore. And this is going to be occurring all night and into the morning. And these hurricane force winds are going to be well inland. So not only dealing with storm surge, we're going to deal with a lot of power outages and disruption and damage from winds. And so this is a lot of oil and gas down there, a lot of people as well. Do you have any sense of the extent to which they've been successful in evacuating? No. And again, we've been trying to convince people that even with COVID, we just tell them COVID's bad. Drowning is worse. You need to move to higher ground. And these areas... In some places, they're looking at 20 feet or more water uh, over their normal high tides. 
So, Craig, as we look at this, this is going to cost a lot of money. They're talking about something like maybe $15 billion in damages, and that number seems to be going up as the day has gone on. It's also going to cost a lot of money for the federal government to really uh, take care of this problem. Aren't we using a lot of these emergency funds already for some of the executive orders President Trump put out to help, for example, the unemployed? Yeah, but I don't think this is going to be the challenge. Uh, FEMA will have enough money for the initial response, and if the numbers come in and FEMA requires more money, uh, Congress will do a supplemental. Uh, so my concern isn't that. My concern right now is really the life safety. I don't worry about FEMA. I don't think people should be worried about FEMA running out of money in this response. We need to be focused on life safety right now. Is there anything we could be doing to sort of get ready for these sorts of storms in advance? So it seems like they're coming more and more frequently, and if anything, seem to be more severe. Well, where and how we build is making us vulnerable. And as we think about infrastructure and we think about possibly investing in infrastructure, we need to start building to our future risk, not our past history. This area is getting hit by a hurricane that's never had one this strong before. But we're hearing that time and time again. And we keep building the way it was. We need to build the way it is. Hey, Clarence, this is Rick Davis. Uh, you know, on this issue of preparation, uh, you know, I know there are a lot of pre-placements in the Gulf Coast of uh, FEMA assets. Have they been rallied already to uh, be put in place before this storm hits, or were they waiting to see what uh, route it was going to take? No, they've been moving. In fact, uh, search and rescue teams as far away from my home state of Florida hit the road today. So nobody waits for the storm to hit and assess and find out how bad it is, but you got to also move close enough where you can be in there without getting you know, damaged by the storm itself. So all across the states, uh, Louisiana, Texas, and their teams, uh, FEMA, other states have been mobilizing now for the last couple of days and are now moving so they can respond quickly as the storm starts moving out of that area. Yeah, Mr. Fugate, you mentioned the issue of infrastructure, and we haven't seen any movement over the last several years, despite the fact that both parties seem to agree that we need a massive infrastructure investment. We haven't seen that. So what would you like to see? What should we be asking Congress to do and the president to sign as these hurricanes and storms seem to be coming to more places and we don't seem prepared infrastructure-wise to handle them? Not only hurricanes, derechos hitting Iowa, wildfires in the West. Uh, our infrastructure was not built for today's environment, and in many cases, it hasn't even been maintained for what we used to consider normal standards. I think it's time the country makes some big investments in infrastructure. Two things I think are critical. We've got to build for the future, but it also would be a great way to jumpstart the economy coming out of this COVID of putting people back to work on you know, construction jobs uh, and putting our industries back to work, building the equipment and tools we need to do those jobs. So let me skip over to California now, because this is not the only thing that FEMA's having to deal with right now. We have massive wildfires right now. There's one fire, I'm told it's 325,000 acres north of San Francisco. Uh, what can be done? Is there infrastructure as well in California that can protect us against those wildfires that seem to be coming again faster and faster and bigger and bigger? Well, this comes back to our building codes and how we build in these uh, areas. We call them an interface between the wildland and the and where we're building homes. Uh, but we've got so much built infrastructure now, uh, and wildfires are one, floods another, uh, that we really need to change how we think about where and how we build, incorporate the risks so that communities are safer. We're not having to spend the tax dollars cleaning up after the mess. And we minimize the impacts that we're seeing from these disruptions in our weather patterns uh, that are not based upon the last hundred years. I mean, we keep setting records each year with these extreme weather events. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Fugate. Really appreciate it. That's Craig Fugate. He's the former FEMA administrator under President Obama and currently Chief Emergency Management Officer at One Concern. And we have some news, actually, pertaining to some of what we've been talking about, going back now to the situation in Kenosha. It's just crossed the Bloomberg that the Reds and the Brewers game, that's baseball, have been rescheduled as part of a double hutter tomorrow, and the Milwaukee Brewers, or they'll make it up tomorrow. Major League Baseball says they're going to make it up. So on the night where race is playing such a big role in events outside the Republican convention, we are awaiting the remarks of Clarence Henderson, a civil rights activist who participated in the Greensboro sit-ins back some 60 years ago today. So, Jeannie, we're going to hear from Mr. Henderson and why he supports uh, President Trump. And he's not the only one who said that. We heard Vernon Jones yesterday, Georgia state legislator, saying the same thing. Yeah, the, the Republican Party in the campaign has done a good job of trying to make the case. You know, the Democrats have been saying, 
saying the party, the president is racist. Joe Biden got into the race because of what happened in Charlottesville. And they're trying very, very hard to counter that, that this is another speech that has been a, a part of part of this sort of attempt to do that. And, you know, they do have points to make. The president's investment in historically black colleges and universities, for instance, is one of the high points that they talk an awful lot about. So it is an interesting point to hear, but the question is, who are they trying to appeal to? And it's usually suburban voters who want cover to vote for Trump. Well, it's, it's such a great point, Rick, that Jeannie's making right now. I mean, I don't think that even President Trump thinks he's going to get the majority of African-American voters come November. At the same time, you can do well just even on the margin with African-American voters. I mean, give us some sense of where, for example, uh, George W. Bush, did, how they did uh, with African-Americans as opposed to Donald Trump. Yeah, the trading range with Republicans on a national basis is anywhere from, you know, low single digits, which is what John McCain got running against Barack Obama, which you would uh, you imagine is it would be normal, uh, to, you know, 11, 12 percent. Um, the reality is that you really don't want to give up all that turf as a political party. You really want to try and make inroads. And Trump has done some symbolic things that um, would give him some credit in that community. But you can't miss what's happening today. You mentioned, you know, the Brewers game being suspended. But there are games in the WNBA, the, the, the uh, NBA, the other Major League Baseball games have been shuttered tonight, soccer. And now tennis is being affected as a way of demonstrating support for a uh, broader social uh, justice uh, reconciliation in our country. So when you have society moving at this pace, uh, if you want to not get on the wrong side of history, you've got to move along with it. Well, it's fascinating you say that because, of course, President Trump has a little bit of a history here with professional sports leagues and his position on them. We remember how he came out against the NFL about kneeling during the national anthem. And, in fact, as I recall, Vice President Pence actually actually walked out of one game because there was kneeling going on. He's taking a strong position against that. It's going to be interesting to see what he does in this circumstance. And now we are waiting for Clarence Henderson. He's the civil rights activist. Among the most extraordinary was the civil rights movement. Sixty years ago, segregation was legal and enforced. The simple act of sitting at a lunch counter could lead to physical harm, jail time, or worse. I know from personal experience, walking into Woolworth's department store on February 2, 1960, I knew it was unlike any day I'd experienced before. My friends had been denied service the day before because of the color of their skin. We knew it wasn't right. But when we went back the next day, I didn't know whether I was going to come out in a vertical or prone position, in handcuffs or on a stretcher, or even in a body bag. By sitting down to order a cup of coffee, we challenged injustice. We knew it was necessary, but we didn't know what would happen. We faced down the KKK. We were cursed at and called all kinds of names. They threatened to kill us, and some of us were arrested. But it was worth it. Our actions inspired similar protests throughout the South against racial injustice. And in the end, segregation was abolished and our country moved a step closer to true equality for all. That's what actual peaceful protests can accomplish. America isn't perfect. We're always improving. But the great thing about this country is that it's not where you come from, it's where you're going. I was born on what some would call the wrong side of the tracks. I don't even have a birth certificate. I never attended an integrated school and I'm the only one out of my immediate family who graduated from college, an HBCU. I'm a military veteran and a civil rights activist. And you know what else? I'm a Republican, and I support Donald Trump. If that sounds strange, you don't know your history. It was the Republican Party that passed the 13th Amendment, abolishing slavery. It was a Republican Party that passed the 14th Amendment, giving black men citizenship. It was the Republican Party that passed the 15th Amendment, giving black men the right to vote. Freedom of thought is a powerful thing. There are Americans, 
voters all over the country who media is trying to convince to conform to the same old Democratic talking points. You know what that'll get you? The same old results. Joe Biden had the audacity to say, if you don't vote for him, you ain't black. Well, to that, I say, if you do vote for Biden, you don't know history. Donald Trump is not a politician. He's a leader. Politicians are a dime a dozen. Leaders are priceless. The record funding Trump gave HBCUs is priceless, too. So are the record number of jobs he created for the black community and the investment he drove into our neighborhoods with tax incentives and opportunity zones. And so are the lives he restored by passing criminal justice reform, where 91 percent of the inmates released are black. These achievements demonstrate that Donald Trump truly cares about black lives. His policies show his heart. He has done more for black Americans in four years than Joe Biden has done in 50. Donald Trump is offering real and lasting change, an unprecedented opportunity to, to rise, a country that embraces the spirit of the civil rights movement of the 60s, a place where people are judged by the content of their character, their talents and abilities, not by the color of their skin. This is the America I was fighting for 60 years ago. This is the America Donald Trump is fighting for today. Let's all join in this fight for re-electing President Trump on November 3rd. Thank you. We've been listening to Clarence Henderson, a civil rights activist who participated in the Greensboro sit-ins back in 1960. Welcome now Joe Watkins, senior consultant with Causeway Strategies. Reverend Watkins worked as an aide to President George Herbert Walker Bush. Still with us are Bloomberg contributors Rick Davis and Jeannie Zeno. Joe, thank you so very much for being with us. Give us some insight from your perspective into this relationship between the Republican Party and African Americans. It's a complicated one. It's more nuanced than perhaps we realize. Well, sure. Uh, I, I think Mr. Henderson made a, a number of, uh, of true comments. Uh, black people, of course, because Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves, uh, were uh, loyal Republicans in the 1800s and uh, early 1900s. And up until about the 1950s, uh, blacks still voted in large number with the Republican Party. Uh, of course, as blacks migrated to the northern cities in the 60s uh, and, and 70s, uh, uh, more blacks uh, voted with, uh, with Democrats, especially when Martin Luther King's father, Martin Luther King's father, who was a Republican, uh, got a call from John Kennedy when his son was uh, in prison in 1960 and, and then decided to support John Kennedy in that campaign. Uh, that was probably the first campaign where a majority of African Americans voted Democrat. And of course, we know since then it's been in overwhelming numbers. So it's not unusual for African Americans to vote over 90 percent with the Democratic Party. And, uh, and, and we certainly saw that in the last uh, election cycle. It may happen again in this one, uh, although. It, uh, these kinds of speeches uh, at the convention from uh, from credible people uh, are likely to to shave off a few percentage points and uh, and give President Trump not eight or nine percent as he may have gotten last time, but maybe ten, eleven, twelve percent, thirteen percent, which is significant for him. Yeah, Reverend, it's great to see you. Um, I, I wanted to ask you just where you, what you were talking about. Um, you know, they have made a concerted push the last couple days at this convention and certainly today to make a push that Donald Trump has been making for some time that what he's done has been good for African Americans. They talk about unemployment, the Criminal Justice Act, which was certainly one of the highlights of his work, his investment in HBCUs. Um, what do you think the Republican Party needs to do? We remember post 2000. 2012, that famous report where they said we need to reach out, and you just made the case that you know they probably won't get where they want to be this election cycle. What can the Republican Party do to reach out and attract more African American support at this point, if not in this election cycle going forward? Well, policy and certainly uh, conversation um, and inclusion will have a lot to do with uh, any uh, large scale change in terms of uh, representation. Uh, in the party and, and, and the support of more people of color in the party. Uh, you, you've got Tim Scott, who gave a, a great speech on Monday night, and that spoke, I think, to lots of Americans and certainly to uh, a, a number of African Americans, because his experience in life is, 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 uh, is typical of, of the experience of many people of color in this country. And he's overcome a great deal to become a member of the United States Senate. 
And, uh, and then he has uh, led the fight on a lot of the right issues, including the, the George Floyd Act, which would uh, bring about substantial and substantive uh, police reform, uh, which is something that needs to happen and would help avert some of the sad uh, and difficult uh, situations we see in some cities around the country. So uh, you, you've got some examples of people of color who are credible, uh, who uh, are beginning to emerge in the party, but a lot more has to be done. Uh, African Americans are not likely to forget soon the comments that were made uh, after the Charlottesville incident. And so um, uh, the president was, was wise to make a comment after it happened, and then he made additional comments which kind of neutralized the initial comment that he had made. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that, uh, that people of color are not going to vote in, in large scale with, with President Trump, although you may see as many as 12, 13, 14, 15 percent of, of blacks. And if he gets that percentage, that's, right. that, that's helpful. Right. Hey, Joe, this is Rick Davis out of Washington. You know, just picking up on this, I mean, hey, even Rick. during your administration, uh, there, was, uh, there was a lot of work being done by people like Jack Kemp, who we talked about last night, leading the fight to try and reach out to the African American community with his enterprise zones. I mean, there always has seemed to be a good foothold in the Republican Party and the black community, but we've never been able to make any progress with it. Is that a lack of continuity over time? Uh, obviously, you mentioned, you know, reactions to things like the Charlottesville uh, uh, marches that uh, set us back, you know, certainly as a party in the last couple of years. But um, where along the path did we go wrong that we couldn't open up that, that dialogue with the African-American community better? Well, uh, it's something that takes time, and it takes time, and then it takes, it takes uh, leadership. You, you, if there are people of color who are elected to positions of, of power and influence, I mean, back in the 60s, you had uh, Senator Ed Brooke, uh, uh, an African-American who was elected to the United States Senate from the state of, of Massachusetts. That was significant for people of color. And, and if you had had uh, that kind of continued uh, uh, growth in the party, uh, certainly among the leadership, if you had uh, certainly more black Republican members of the House of Representatives supported to be elected, that is, to win. I was a candidate once for, for a congressional seat, but, but I clearly... Uh, didn't get, I got past the primary, but didn't get past the general election. If, if the Republicans could target people of color in districts and get them elected uh, to office, that, that's certainly helpful. We've had some people, Will Hurd, uh, Mia Love, we've had a, a number of people of color, Alan West, who've uh, held uh, House seats, but you, you need larger numbers of people of color, and you need some black U.S. senators, and you need some black governors uh, uh, as well, black chief executives, governors, right. uh, as well as the many black mayors that you have. But uh, to the degree that you see more people of color in positions of leadership right. uh, having right. a chance to, to make statements on behalf of the party, you, then you'll see some change in the numbers. Joe, it's always such a great privilege to have you with us. That is Joe Watkins, White House aide to President George Herbert Walker Bush. Thanks so much. And we want to check in on the convention right now. And Mr. Rick Grinnell, he was former ambassador to Germany as well as acting director of national intelligence. Listen to a bit of what Mr. Grinnell has to say. The American tradition of helping the president-elect transition into the White House, they tried instead to undercut him even more. Former Vice President Joe Biden asked intelligence officials to uncover the hidden information on President Trump's incoming national security advisor three weeks before the inauguration. That's the Democrats. Between surveillance, classifications, leaks, and puppet candidates, they never want the American people to know who's actually calling the shots. But with Donald Trump, you always know exactly who is in charge. Because the answer is you. You're in charge. Not lobbyists, not special interests, not warmongers or China sympathizers or globalization fanatics. With Donald Trump and Mike Pence in the White House, the boss is the American people. President Trump rightly calls his foreign policy America first. America first does not advance the interests of one group of Americans at the expense of another. It has no bias about red or blue, educated or not educated, urban or rural. America first is We have been listening to the convention and Ambassador Rick Grinnell, former ambassador to Germany, with his remarks for the convention. But right now, we want to go over to Asia. This is a night where we're going to hear from Vice President Pence 
And there have been developments even today in the U.S.-China relations as China today fired four ballistic missiles in the South China Sea as part of military exercises there. Welcome now Bloomberg's chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel, with the latest. So what's the reaction over there to what's going on in what seems to be increased tension, military tension, in the South China Sea? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, the China-U.S. relationship is a focal point of this election in the United States, and uh, we see it firsthand out here where I am in Hong Kong. And, you know, you have to decide whether is this, you know, provocation, military provocation, or is it more an example of, uh, what, election-era uh, theater? But regardless, it's on a dangerous stage here because what we've learned from the U.S. military is that the Chinese military in these uh, exercises in the South China Sea between Hainan Island and the Parasol Islands fired four medium-range ballistic missiles, including, we're hearing, a, a DF-21D. That is a Dongfang 21D, so-called carrier killer missile that was fired from the mainland of China into the South China Sea. Provocative indeed. Uh, and separately, we're also hearing that the U.S. has announced uh, trade and visa restrictions coming from the Commerce Department and the Secretary of State on 24 Chinese companies that the U.S. says is tied to uh, the PLA, the People's Liberation Army's uh, expansion in the South China Sea. Uh, 24 companies added to this entities list and will Ross saying the entities designated today have played a significant role in China's provocative construction of the artificial islands and must be held accountable. Now, separately, the State Department as well wants the bank here, HSBC, held accountable for what they say is, uh, you know, limiting freedoms for its uh, account holders here in Hong Kong. Completely separate issue, but again, part of the political theater between China and the United States. Thank you, Stephen, for that great report. That's Bloomberg's chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. And also find out how the Asian markets are reacting to all of this from with Sophie Cameroon and maybe more about the South Korean Central Bank, right, Sophie? Yeah, that's right, David. We are seeing limited risk-off moves amid the ongoing U.S.-China tussle. Chinese stocks are fluctuating today with the Shanghai benchmark under pressure, but off session lows, testing a key support level that's been in place since June. And the offshore yuan pretty unfazed, trading around January highs still below 690. And rising virus cases remain a big concern in Asia. The Kospi losing ground in Seoul after the Bank of Korea held rates and cut the GDP forecast. The BOK governor in his press brief today saying that the easing sense will be maintained. Now, switching out the board for a look at what's going on here in Hong Kong, the Hang Seng falling the most in a week with HSBC shares among the biggest drags. But the appetite has not dampened for Chinese tech darlings. Xiaomi jumping on its earnings beat. And while uncertainty still looms over Chinese ADRs, Guangzhou-based EV maker Xpeng has priced its upsized U.S. IPO offering above the marketed range set to raise one and a half billion U.S. dollars. And Tencent Music's dollar bond debut, that saw demand at nearly 15 times the deal size. And David, last word, an ICBC shares falling ahead of China's bank earnings kicking off right. on Friday. The mega lenders right. have been leaned on by Beijing to prop up the economy and so are expected to forgo profits. We got the latest update on Chinese industrial profits speaking to that recovery, jumping the most in two years in July. But going forward, strained U.S. tensions could okay. slow that pickup, given we've seen that... Yep. Uh, dampening effect on hassle demand as well in China. Great. Thank you so much to Bloomberg Sophie Cameroon. And we are waiting right now for Vice President Mike Pence, who is slated to begin speaking in just a couple of minutes from right now. We're going to set the stage now. We want to bring back in our Bloomberg contributors, Rick Davis, as well as Jeannie Zeno. So, Rick, what does the president need out of the vice president tonight? Well, I think he's going to continue some of the messaging that we've seen today. Uh, you know, the great heroes of our uh, nation are the men and women in the service. And, uh, and a salute to them. He's got a son in the service. So that's a, a very natural uh, thing for the vice president to do. But on the other hand, he's also got a job to do, and that's going after uh, uh, Joe Biden. I mean, the, the typical and traditional role of the vice president's speech is to take a baseball back and swing wildly. So I think that's probably what we'll get the news out of tonight, but uh, we'll wait and see what uh, Vice President Pence does. Yeah, Jeannie, this is a point that Rick made earlier today. I don't typically think of Vice President Pence as being an attack dog. We've seen that in vice presidents before. I don't normally associate that with Mike Pence. He's going to have to take a different attitude tonight. 
Yeah, that's not the personality of Mike no. Pence that we know, but it's certainly the role that he's in. And I think one important thing to underscore, he's the chairman of the coronavirus task force. Yeah. And we haven't heard an awful lot about that last night. The first lady mentioned it. So it'll be interesting to hear how he defends that, because, of course, that's where the president is trailing in the polls. People don't like how he's handled this. And I think we're going to hear Mike Pence say that they've done a good job and that he has led that effort under the direction of the president. Yeah, and Rick, it'll also be interesting, something we've been talking about, whether he refers it all to Kenosha and even even the, now the suspension of games in the NBA and some MLB as well. Yeah, you've got to pay some attention to the front page of the newspaper on the day of your convention. And even though they are kind of brushing past the coronavirus issue and saying, look, we've handled that, it's under control, right. this one is not under control, and it'll be interesting to see if he brings it up. Right. Now, for our radio audiences, we are watching Vice President Michael Pence with his wife walking into Fort McHenry. That, of course, is in Baltimore, where the famous 1812 battle occurred. And Francis Scott Key wrote the poem that gave rise to the lyrics for the Star Spangled Banner. So this is a rich history now in Baltimore Harbor from the War of 1812. And the crowd, there's a live crowd there. They're waving to the crowd as they applaud. Standing ovation there from the crowd for the Vice President of the United States and his wife. And they should be beginning their remarks just any moment now after a brief moment of affection. So here he is, Vice President Pence. Good evening, America. It's an honor to speak to you tonight from the hallowed, from grounds, the hallowed of grounds of Fort McHenry, the site of the very battle that inspired the words of our national anthem. Those words have inspired this land of heroes in every generation since. It was on this site 206 years ago when our young republic heroically withstood a ferocious naval bombardment from the most powerful empire on earth. They came to crush our revolution, to divide our nation, and to end the American experiment. The heroes who held this fort took their stand for life, liberty, freedom, and the American flag. And those ideals have defined our nation. But they were hardly ever mentioned at last week's Democratic National Convention. Instead, Democrats spent four days attacking America. Joe Biden said that we were living through a season of darkness. But as President Trump said, where Joe Biden sees American darkness, we see American greatness. In these challenging times, our country needs a president who believes in America, who believes in the boundless capacity of the American people to meet any challenge, defeat any foe, and defend the freedoms we hold dear. America needs four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. Before I go further, allow me to say a word to the families and communities in the path of Hurricane Laura. Our prayers are with you tonight. And our administration is working closely with authorities in the states that will be impacted. FEMA has mobilized resources and supplies for those in harm's way. This is a serious storm, and we urge all those in the affected areas to heed state and local authorities. Stay safe and know that we'll be with you every step of the way to support, rescue, respond, and recover in the days and weeks ahead. That's what Americans do. Four years ago, I answered the call to join this ticket because I knew that Donald Trump had the leadership and the vision to make America great again. And for the last four years, 
I've watched this president endure unrelenting attacks, but get up every day and fight to keep the promises that he made to the American people. So with gratitude for the confidence President Donald Trump has placed in me, the support of our Republican Party, and the grace of God, I humbly accept your nomination to run and serve as Vice President of the United States. Serving the American people in this office has been a journey I never expected. It's a journey that would not have been possible without the support of my family, beginning with my wonderful wife, Karen. She's a lifelong school teacher, an incredible mother to our three children. And she is one outstanding second lady of the United States. I'm so proud of you. And we couldn't be more proud of our three children. Marine Corps Captain Michael J. Pence and his wife, Sarah. Our daughter, Charlotte Pence Bond, an author, and the wife to Lieutenant Henry Bond, who is currently deployed and serving our nation in the United States Navy. And our youngest, a recent law school grad, our daughter Audrey and her fiance, who, like so many other Americans, had to delay their wedding this summer. But we can't wait for Dan to be a part of our family. In addition, to my wife and kids, the person who shaped my life the most is also with us tonight. My mom, Nancy. She is the daughter of an Irish immigrant, 87 years young. And mom follows politics very closely. And the truth be told, sometimes I think I'm actually her second favorite candidate on the Trump-Pence <laughs> ticket. Thank you, Mom. I love you. Over the past four years, I've had the privilege to work closely with our president. I've seen him when the cameras are off. Americans see President Trump in lots of different ways. But there's no doubt how President Trump sees America. He sees America for what it is. A nation that has done more good in this world than any other. A nation that deserves far more gratitude than grievance. And if you want a president who falls silent when our heritage is demeaned or insulted, he's not your man. Now, we came by very different routes to this partnership. And some people think we're a little bit different. But you know, I've learned a few things watching him. Watching him deal with all that we've been through over the past four years. He does things in his own way, on his own terms. Not much gets past him. And when he has an opinion, he's liable to share it. <laughs> he certainly kept things interesting. But more importantly, President Donald Trump has kept his word to the American people. In a city known for talkers, President Trump is a doer. And few presidents have brought more independence, energy, or determination to that office. 
Four years ago, we inherited a military hollowed out by devastating budget cuts, an economy struggling to break out of the slowest recovery since the Great Depression. ISIS controlled a land mass twice the size of Pennsylvania, and we witnessed a steady assault on our most cherished values, freedom of religion and the right to life. That's when President Donald Trump stepped in. And from day one, he kept his word. We rebuilt our military. This president signed the largest increase in our national defense since the days of Ronald Reagan and created the first new branch of our armed forces in 70 years, the United States Space Force. And with that renewed energy, we also returned American astronauts to space on an American rocket for the first time in nearly 10 years. And after years of scandal that robbed our veterans of the care that you earned in the uniform of the United States, President Trump kept his word again. We reformed the VA, and Veterans Choice is now available for every veteran in America. Our armed forces and our veterans fill this land of heroes. And many join us tonight in this historic fort. Tonight, we have among us four recipients of the Medal of Honor. Six recipients of the Purple Heart. A Gold Star Mother of a gallant Navy SEAL. and wounded warriors from Soldier Strong, a group that serves our injured veterans every day. We are honored by your presence, and we thank you for your service. With heroes just like these, we defend this nation every day. And under this Commander-in-Chief, we've taken the fight to radical Islamic terrorists on our terms on their soil. Last year, American armed forces took the last inch of ISIS territory, crushed their caliphate, and took down their leader without one American casualty. And I was there when President Trump gave the order to take out the world's most dangerous terrorist, Iran's top general will never harm another American because Qasem Soleimani is gone. <laughs> My fellow Americans, you deserve to know, Joe Biden criticized President Trump following those decisions, decisions to rid the world of two terrorist leaders. But it's not surprising, because history records that Joe Biden even opposed the operation that took down Osama bin Laden. It's no wonder that the Secretary of Defense under the Obama-Biden administration once said that Joe Biden has been, and I quote, wrong on nearly every major foreign policy and national security issue over the past four decades. So we've stood up to our enemies, and we've stood with our allies. Like when President Trump kept his word and moved the American embassy to Jerusalem, the capital of the state of Israel, setting the stage for the first Arab country to recognize Israel in 26 years. Closer to home, we appointed more than 200 conservative judges to our federal courts. We supported the right to life 
and all the God-given liberties enshrined in our Constitution, including the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And when it came to the economy, President Trump kept his word and then some. We passed the largest tax cut and reform in American history. We rolled back more federal red tape than any administration ever had. We unleashed American energy and fought for free and fair trade. And in our first three years, businesses large and small created more than 7 million good-paying jobs, including 500,000 manufacturing jobs all across America. Our country became a net exporter of energy for the first time in 70 years. Unemployment rates for African Americans and Hispanic Americans hit the lowest level ever recorded. And on this 100th anniversary of the woman's right to vote, I'm proud to report that under President Donald Trump, we achieved the lowest unemployment rate for women in 65 years. and more Americans working than ever before. In our first three years, we built the greatest economy in the world. We made America great again. And then the coronavirus struck from China. Before the first case of the coronavirus spread within the United States, the president took unprecedented action and suspended all travel from China, the second largest economy in the world. Now, that action saved untold American lives. And I can tell you firsthand, it bought us invaluable time to launch the greatest national mobilization since World War II. President Trump marshaled the full resources of our federal government from the outset. He directed us to forge a seamless partnership with governors across America in both political parties. We partnered with private industry to reinvent testing and produce supplies that, that were distributed to hospitals around the land. Today, we're conducting more than 800,000 tests a day, and we have coordinated the delivery of billions of pieces of personal protective equipment for our amazing doctors, nurses, and healthcare workers. We saw to the manufacture of 100,000 ventilators in 100 days. And no one who required a ventilator was ever denied a ventilator in the United States. We built hospitals, surged military medical personnel, and enacted an economic rescue package that saved 50 million American jobs. And as we speak, we're developing a growing number of treatments known as therapeutics, including convalescent plasma that are saving lives all across America. Now, last week, Joe Biden said that no miracle is coming. Well, what Joe doesn't seem to understand is that America is a nation of miracles. And I'm proud to report that we're on track to have the world's first safe, effective coronavirus vaccine by the end of this year. After all the sacrifice, in this year like no other, all the hardship, we're finding our way forward again. But tonight, our hearts are with all the families who've lost loved ones and have family members still struggling with serious illness. In this country, we mourn with those who mourn. We grieve with those who grieve. And this night, I know that millions of Americans will pause and pray for God's comfort for each of you. You know, our country doesn't get through such a time unless its people find strength within. The response of doctors, nurses, 
first responders, farmers, factory workers, truckers, and everyday Americans who put the health and safety of their neighbors first has been nothing short of heroic. <laughs> Veronica Sayez put on her scrubs every day. Day in and day out, went to work in one of New York City's busiest hospitals. She stayed on the job, put in the long hours until it was done, and then got back in her neighborhood and helped neighbors and friends struggling. Her brother William is a New York City firefighter. And they're both emblematic of heroes all across this country. They're with us tonight. And I say to them and to all of you, you have earned the admiration of the American people, and we will always be grateful for your service and care. Thanks to the courage and compassion of the American people, we're slowing the spread. We're protecting the vulnerable. And we're saving lives. And we're opening up America again. Because of the strong foundation that President Trump poured in our first three years, we've already gained back 9.3 million jobs in the last three months alone. And we're not just opening up America again. We're opening up America's schools. And I'm proud to report that my wife, Karen, that school teacher I've been married to, will be returning to her classroom next week. And so to all of our heroic teachers and faculty and staff, Thank you for being there for our kids. We're going to stay with you every step of the way. In the days ahead, as we open up America again, I promise you, we'll continue to put the health of America first. And as we work to bring this economy back, we all have a role to play. And we all have a choice to make. On November 3rd, you need to ask yourself, who do you trust to rebuild this economy? A career politician who presided over the slowest economic recovery since the Great Depression? Or a proven leader who created the greatest economy in the world? The choice is clear. To bring America all the way back, we need four more years of President Donald Trump in the White House. My fellow Americans, we're passing through a time of testing. But in the midst of this global pandemic, just as our nation had begun to recover, we've seen violence and chaos in the streets of our major cities. President Trump and I will always support the right of Americans to peaceful protest. But rioting and looting is not peaceful protest. Tearing down statues is not free speech. And those who do so will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Last week, Joe Biden didn't say one word about the violence and chaos engulfing cities across this country. So let me be clear. The violence must stop, whether in Minneapolis, Portland or Kenosha.
Too many heroes have died defending our freedom to see Americans strike each other down. We will have law and order on the streets of this country for every American of every race and creed and color. President Trump and I know that the men and women that put on the uniform of law enforcement are the best of us. Every day, when they walk out that door, they consider our lives more important than their own. People like Dave Patrick Underwood, an officer in the Department of Homeland Security's Federal Protective Service, who was shot and killed during the riots in Oakland, California. Dave's heroism is emblematic of the heroes that serve in blue every day. And we're privileged tonight to be joined by his sister, Angela. Angela, we say to you, we, we grieve with your family. And America will never forget or fail to honor Officer Dave Patrick Underwood. The American people know we don't have to choose between supporting law enforcement and standing with our African American neighbors to improve the quality of their lives, education, jobs, and safety. And from the first days of this administration, we've done both. And we will keep supporting law enforcement and keep supporting our African American and minority communities across this land for four more years. Now, Joe Biden says that America is systemically racist and that law enforcement in America has, and I quote, an implicit bias against minorities. When asked whether he'd support cutting funding to law enforcement, Joe Biden replied, yes, absolutely. Joe Biden would double down on the very policies that are leading to violence in America's cities. The hard truth is, you won't be safe in Joe Biden's America. And under President Trump, we will always stand with those who stand on the thin blue line, and we're not going to defund the police, not now, not ever. My fellow Americans, we're passing through a time of testing, but soon we will come to a time for choosing. Joe Biden has referred to himself as a transition candidate, and many were asking, transition to what? But last week, Democrats didn't talk very much about their agenda. And if I were them, I wouldn't either. I mean, Bernie Sanders did tell his followers that Joe Biden would be the most liberal president in modern times. In fact, he said, and I quote, that many of the ideas he fought for, that just a few years ago were considered radical, are now mainstream in the Democratic Party. At the root of their agenda is the belief that America is driven by envy not aspiration, that millions of Americans harbor ill will toward our neighbors instead of loving our neighbors as ourselves. The radical left believes that the federal government must be involved in every aspect of our lives to correct 
those American wrongs. They believe the federal government needs to dictate how Americans live, how we should work, how we should raise our children, and in the process deprive our people of freedom, prosperity, and security. Their agenda is based on government control. Our agenda is based on freedom. Where President Trump cut taxes, Joe Biden wants to raise taxes by nearly $4 trillion. Where this president achieved energy independence for the United States, Joe Biden would abolish fossil fuels, end fracking, and impose a regime of climate change regulations that would drastically increase the cost of living for working families. Where we fought for free and fair trade, and this president stood up to China and ended the era of economic surrender, Joe Biden has been a cheerleader for communist China. He wants to repeal all the tariffs that are leveling the playing field for American workers. And he actually criticized President Trump for suspending all travel to China at the outset of this pandemic. Joe Biden is for open borders, sanctuary cities, free lawyers and health care for illegal immigrants. And President Trump, he secured our border and built nearly 300 miles of that border wall. <laughs> Joe Biden wants to end school choice. And President Trump believes that every parent should have the right to choose where their children go to school, regardless of their income or area code. President Trump, President Trump has stood without apology for the sanctity of human life every day of this administration. Joe Biden, he supports taxpayer funding of abortion right up to the moment of birth. When you consider their agenda, it's clear. Joe Biden would be nothing more than a Trojan horse for the radical left. The choice in this election has never been clearer, and the stakes have never been higher. Last week, Joe Biden said, democracy's on the ballot. And the truth is, our economic recovery is on the ballot. Law and order are on the ballot. But so are things far more fundamental and foundational to our country. In this election, it's not so much whether America will be more conservative or more liberal, more Republican or more Democrat. The choice in this election is whether America remains America. It's whether we will leave to our children and our grandchildren a country grounded in our highest ideals of freedom, free markets, and the unalienable right to life and liberty or whether we will leave them a country that's fundamentally transformed into something else. We stand at a crossroads, America. President Trump has set our nation on a path of freedom and opportunity. Joe Biden would set America on a path of socialism and decline. But we're not going to let it happen. President Donald Trump believes in America and in the goodness of the American people. The boundless potential of every American to live out their dreams in freedom. And every day, President Trump has been fighting to protect the promise of America. Every day, our president has been fighting to expand the reach of the American dream. And every day, President Donald Trump has been fighting for you. And now it's our turn to fight for him. <laughs> On this night in the company of heroes, I'm deeply grateful. Deeply grateful for the privilege of serving as vice president of this great nation and to have the opportunity to serve again. I pray to be worthy of it.
and I will give that duty all that's in me. In the year 2020, the American people have had more than our share of challenges. But thankfully, we have a president with the toughness, energy, and resolve to see us through. Now, those traits actually run in our national character. As the invading force learned on approach to this fort in September of 1814, against fierce and sustained bombardment, our young country was defended by heroes, not so different from those who are with us tonight. The enemy was counting on them to quit, but they never did. Fort McHenry held, and when morning came, our flag was still here. My fellow Americans, we're going through a time of testing. But if you look through the fog of these challenging times, you will see. Our flag is still there today. That star-spangled banner still waves over the land of the free and the home of the brave. From these hallowed grounds, American patriots in generations gone by did their part to defend freedom. Now it's our turn. So let's run the race marked out for us. Let's fix our eyes on O Glory and all she represents. Let's fix our eyes on this land of heroes and let their courage inspire. And let's fix our eyes on the author and perfecter of our faith and our freedom. And never forget that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That means freedom always wins. My fellow Americans, thank you for the honor of addressing you tonight and the opportunity to run and serve again as your Vice President. I leave here today inspired. And I leave here today more convinced than ever that we will do in our time, as Americans have done throughout our long and storied past, we will defend our freedom and our way of life. We will reelect our president and principled Republican leaders across the land. And with President Donald Trump in the White House for four more years, and with God's help, we will make America great again, again. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States of America. And President Mike Pence concludes his prepared remarks to a standing ovation there at Fort McHenry in the harbor in Baltimore with the American flag flying up above with the lights on it. The applause is continuing. He went through the various things that he said that President Trump did to meet his promises to the American people, including building up the military and dealing with the economy, bringing it back to life, and also making sure that we had our religious freedoms and right to life. And now, and now here we have a small surprise. We see the President of the United States with First Lady Melania Trump walking down the hallway to greet Vice President Trump, and we can hear ruffles and flourishes, the anthem for the President of the United States. The president now is moving toward the podium, walking up the stairs to greet his vice president, Mike Pence, applauding one another.
President Trump with a blue tie, my, my, Vice President Pence with a red tie, and both of them with white shirts, so that all added together, that's red, white, and blue as I figure it out. And the crowd continues to stand, shout, shouting four more years. The President and Vice President Pence now are receiving the accolades from the audience, and now the First Lady and the Second Lady join their husbands up on the platform, and we have the national anthem. Say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rocket's red glare The bombs bursting Say, does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the That was Mr. Trace Atkins, very popular country singer, singing the national anthem at the conclusion of Vice President Mike Pence's speech. The president and the vice president with the first and second lady remain there applauding as the audience stands and applauds as well. The president now saluting the wounded veterans that are in the audience, referred to by Vice President Pence during his remarks. They got a standing ovation as well. Okay, we want to bring in back now our political contributors, Jeannie Zeno and Rick, uh, Rick Davis. So, Jeannie, why don't you give us your initial thoughts about Vice President Pence's speech? Well, you can't help but notice it's an absolutely beautiful night at Fort McHenry, yeah. and it's gorgeous. And I think one of the things that struck me, in contrast to the Democrats and Joe Biden in particular, was they were doing this in front of a live crowd. So you had chants of four more years, you had applause, and I think that really does make something of a difference. But, you know, I think the vice president gave a very strong speech tonight. He had all the right points. He reintroduced himself and his family. He personalized the president. He talked about the issues of the day, both the hurricane and COVID. Um, you can obviously argue with some of what he said about each. For instance, he talked about COVID, about the fact that the president had relied on and had strong relations with the governors. That wasn't exactly true <laughs> many, many points of the time. Um, and I also think he did a good job of reiterating what he thinks they've done in the last four years. What I didn't hear a lot about is their plans going forward and what they hope to do. Um, and, you know, I think he also made the case over and over again, contrasting President Trump with Vice President Biden, that President, Vice President Biden is what they call a Trojan horse, that he has been taken yeah. over by the socialist liberal left, and if you elect him, dystopia will reign. And I think that's a major message of this, this you know, convention, and I think we heard it tonight from the Vice President. Yeah, Rick, before the speech, you were wondering what, what Mike Pence might do in terms of really attacking Joe Biden. I think he attacked him pretty effectively. Besides the Trojan horse for radical left, he also called him a cheerleader of, the com of communist China. I'm not exactly Exactly sure what he's referring to there. I'm not aware of what he did to cheerlead <laughs> Communist China, but but did he measure up in your estimation to the attack that the president needed on Vice President Biden? 
Yeah, I think he hit the major themes. <clears throat> you know, they're trying to radicalize uh, the most uh, moderate uh, candidate in the Democratic primary field. So uh, they have to go over and over as a captive of Bernie Sanders, captive of the liberal left, captive of the radicals. And, uh, and I think he hit all those points. I mean, he went through the foreign policy criticisms. He went through the domestic criticisms. You know, so I think that uh, he did it in a kind of nice way. I don't think he was over the top in any shape or form. So he put his own Pence style to the criticism, but he for sure laid out the arguments against Pence in a pretty uh, logical fashion. So, so it's interesting. I want to bring in now Kevin Cerulli, our chief Washington correspondent down in Washington. Kevin, one of the things that strikes me is I wonder if, and Vice President Pence certainly seemed to be doing that tonight, they're not even running against Joe Biden. They're sort of saying Joe Biden isn't the real guy. It's a Trojan horse. He's a transition candidate. They're almost running around all the people around him. He thinks that they're surrounded by radical left. So they're sort of saying he's almost a cipher. On economic policy, absolutely, that is what they are doing. And Vice President Pence's speech, that key moment, coming when he raised the question that Joe Biden calls himself a transition candidate, but a transition into what? And in terms of economic policy of reopening the economy, uh, Vice President Pence sought to con contrast the Obama White House recovery with the recovery that the vice president says President Trump would be able to usher in in a second term. But there's another key issue on foreign coronavirus policy here that is going to come to a boil in the debates, and that is over the restriction, the travel restrictions that President Trump ordered on January 31st. It, it wasn't until early April, April 1st or 2nd, in which the communications director for the Biden campaign came out and said that they were, in fact, in favor of that. In the speech tonight, Vice President Pence uh, raised issue about whether or not uh, uh, Biden would have, in fact, enacted those travel restrictions from China. And that is going to be dissected every which way as uh, the coronavirus handling becomes increasingly politicized in the lead up until Election Day. So, so Kevin, stay with us here for a moment, because I'd like to talk mm -hmm. about something that we've been talking through the, through the evening, and that is the incidents in Kenosha, Wisconsin, the National Guard coming in, and then the NBA coming out and yeah. uh, saying they wouldn't play tonight. We've had some developments. Even as Vice President Pence was speaking, Minneapolis, one of the places he called out to say, we're going to hit law and order in Minneapolis, Minneapolis announced a curfew because of disturbances in the downtown. In the meantime, the L.A. Lakers and the Clippers, the two NBA teams, have voted to not play any more this season. The rest of the teams apparently will be playing. In the meantime, Vice President Pence did address the riots taking place. This is part of what he said in his speech. So let me be clear. The violence must stop, whether in Minneapolis, Portland, or Kenosha. Too many heroes have died defending our freedom to see Americans strike each other down. We will have law and order on the streets of this country for every American of every race and creed and color. So, Rick Davis, there's not much ambiguity in what Vice President said just a short time ago in that speech. Uh, I mean, the issue is joined. I'm not sure there's a lot there that's going to calm some of the troubled waters right now, whether it's the NBA or Kenosha or Minneapolis. Yeah, you're going to see, I think, a cultural reaction that's going to sweep across the country on issues of social injustice. And, and, and I don't quite understand why there's not more room in the Republican message for some sort of reconciliation messaging. I mean, the idea that the only solution to these problems in these cities is more troops, more police, more law and order, just doesn't make too much sense considering what debates are going on in these communities, whether it's in the sports community, whether it's in the business community, whether it's in schools. Uh, everyone's talking about this, and for whatever reason, they just don't seem to be willing to take a step in that direction. And you know what's so fascinating about the clip you just played, and we heard it, it was the biggest applause line yeah. and, and he got of the night, and yet you look at the polls, and they say the two most important issues, coronavirus, the economy by far, law and order, crime way, way down, because, of course, while we're hearing a lot about unrest in the cities, crime overall in the United States, if you look at the statistics, is down. So I can't help but wonder how much of a play they have on this law and order theme if you look at the polls, given what we know. 
So, so, so Kevin Cerulli, you cover this president, you cover this administration so carefully. Uh, and, and I wonder, certainly I'm sure they believe what they're talking about. They believe that law and order is paramount. We have to get back the streets. And goodness knows nobody wants violence on the streets of America. At the same time, is there some political calculus po possibly here as well that maybe they are appealing, particularly with, think of people in the suburbs maybe being worried about that violence? They're, they're playing to people who are watching the unrest in the cities on their cell phones and television uh, sets in the suburbs and who are watching this through the prism of... Uh, and the argument that they're making is that the Democratic-controlled political machines in the cities have not been successful in, in addressing many of the issues that are boiling over. Now, in contrast to that, clearly, there's a national dialogue going on, uh, and, and progressives as well as other, uh, other leading voices on the issues have raised concerns about a series of institutional in, uh, inequality uh, in, in across industries. So that's what's going on for the cities. In terms of the NBA, uh, earlier this evening, I spoke with a senior aide to Senator Marsha Blackburn, a Republican from Tennessee who spoke tonight, uh, and she sent a letter earlier this month earlier this summer to NBA Commissioner Silver uh, with regards to pressing for questions on the league's relationship with investments to Alibaba, on their relationship with having training facilities uh, close to the detention facilities uh, for, for the Uyghur minority group, uh, and in terms of, of the silencing of, 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 of league officials who tweeted support for Hong Kong. So the NBA is about to step into a right. massive conservative right. culture war. Okay, thank you so much to Bloomer's Kevin Cirilli. Kevin, please stay with us, as well as Rick and Jeannie. They'll be staying with us because we're going to have our final thoughts coming up next. This is Bloomberg.